And once again, here we are in Father Spitzer's universe, the place in our universe where faith and reason collide. It's an intersection of thought and ideas. I'm Doug Keck, your host, coming to you from our EWTN studios in the heart of Irondale, Alabama, where Mother Angelica started it all through the power of the Holy Spirit, Mother Angelica Way. We're continuing on with our look through the book, The Light Shines On in the Darkness by uh, Father Spitzer, Transforming Suffering Through Faith. And this is part two of our section having to do with, I am with you, always recognizing God's presence in our suffering. We had so much information from the book. We didn't get to a lot of questions. We'll try to do better and we'll try to move through the book uh, with alacrity, as they say, but it, we will be dealing with it chapter by chapter over the next coming weeks. So stay with us. Email us your questions at spitzersuniverse at EWTN.com. That is the place. Post your questions on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash EWTN online hashtag FSUniverse. Send us a tweet at twitter.com forward slash EWTN hashtag FSUniverse. All social media outreach there, the Magis Center website, great center of information from uh, Father Spitzer. It's magiscenter1word.com. That's the place to go. And don't forget, besides Father's book, we also have Mother Angelica's Quick Guide to the Sacraments. That book is now available through EWTN's Religious Catalog, and it is published by our, very proudly published by EWTN's own publishing company. With that said, once again, we journey out to the West Coast to join Father Spitzer at our studios from Orange County, California, on the campus of Christ Cathedral. As you can see, the beautiful Christ Cathedral there, formerly known as the Crystal Cathedral, and now the home, of course, of the Diocese of Orange, but also of our show, Father Spitzer's Universe, and also Father Spitzer's uh -huh. Outreach as well. His offices are just above the studio. Have you put in that fire pole yet? And not yet, but I'm, uh, but I'm uh, certainly thinking about it. You know, just drop right down here and, and uh, just start the show. Okay, okay. <clears throat> That'd be quite an entrance, too. Right. Now we can, we'll get that one on tape for uh, the Christmas party, as they say. So let's, uh, let's get into some questions right away, because we, uh, we didn't get sure. to as many uh, last week. So first up, here's a question. A few weeks ago, Father, I thought I heard you say that Jesus did not call out individual sinners. But what about with Peter when he said, get thee behind me, Satan? And this is from Richard. So this is going back a few shows ago, talking about God not calling out individual sinners. What do you think? Uh, yes, when uh, Jesus did that, that's uh, of course, uh, um, you know, a rebuke on Jesus's part uh, to Peter directly. And uh, the reason that uh, Jesus does that is not uh, to, um, to talk about, you know, Peter's sin or to call Peter a sinner. He is calling attention to a particular deed that Peter did. Mm -hmm. And that was to say that the cross would not be necessary for Jesus. So recall that, you know, Jesus has been teaching his disciples. And of course, Peter is clearly the number one disciple. He's clearly always present when Jesus just takes up Peter, James, and John. Peter is the first one to be mentioned. Peter is the one that is going, is the obvious heir apparent. And Jesus has been teaching the disciples how to, um, you know, uh, uh, how important the cross is going to be. That the, how important it will be for them to take up their cross and follow in his steps. And suddenly, when Jesus predicts his own passion, Peter starts remonstrating with him and just saying, well, no, it, it should not be so. God forbid mm -hmm. that this should happen to you. Which for Jesus, after all this instruction, is like taking the logic of Satan, mm -hmm. right? The logic which, you know, is scandalized by the cross and throwing it in front of him. So what does he say? He says to Peter by re way of rebuke for that remark, mm -hmm. get behind me, you Satan. That is to say, get behind me, you tempter, mm -hmm. right? Get behind me, you who are using the logic 
of Satan, mm -hmm. right? It's not Peter's sin mm -hmm. that he is talking about. He's talking about a remark that Peter has made mm -hmm. that tries to directly influence Jesus away from the will of God toward the will of Satan, the tempter. And so he's just calling Peter on that. Mm -hmm not for his sinfulness. Okay. But it's a really good question. Right. Well, let me ask you then, so Peter's actions at that time, mm -hmm. were they just his own personal spontaneous reaction to the situation, or was he being acted on by the devil at the time to have that reaction? Well, um, hard to tell, you know, uh, but of course, Peter uh, loves the Lord. He, he can't stand the thought that, you know, Jesus is going to have to suffer. And of course, he's so loyal, mm. he can't stand the thought that, that uh, you know, Jesus would actually, um, um, uh, you, know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, be suffering an indignity before human beings. Mm -hmm. he, he just can't imagine it. And so, uh, as Peter is wont to do, right, he blurts out his first reaction. Uh -huh. But Jesus wants to nip it in the bud. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want him to be doing that in the future. He's got to face this. That's a good enough challenge on its own. He doesn't need Peter trying to stand in the way of it, making a public display before the other apostles. So he's telling Peter, you know, quit this conduct, mm -hmm. cut it out because it's not helping me. Mm -hmm. You're actually hurting the cause here. And whose influence do you think you're running under? You're running under the influence of Satan. He's the one who doesn't want the cross, mm -hmm. not, you know, my father who knows that the cross is the path to unconditional self-sacrifice, and unconditional self-sacrifice is unconditional love, which we, the Father and the Son, are doing together for the whole world. Mm -hmm. So Peter still doesn't get it. So Jesus, as it were, nips the conduct in the bud, mm -hmm. which he had to do. Right, exactly. Okay, let's ask another question that uh, from our last show person wrote to us and said, this is on Facebook, my son died of cancer three years ago, and now, this is tough, my yeah. daughter is battling cancer as I write this. I, we pray for you. Of course, I yeah. have yet to see what good has come out of this suffering. What do you believe is the best way to deal with suffering in times of grief? And this is Dinah. I would say two th things, Dinah, to, to concentrate on. Uh, first, uh, you know, I'm not saying buy this book, but if you can go to your local library, you might want to look at chapter 7 and chapter 8 of the book. Chapter 7 lists 10 opportunities of suffering, mm -hmm. and chapter 8 talks about offering up our suffering as a way of a kind of a ministry uh, you know, of love. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the idea of, you know, trying to say, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the good to come out of it. You know, again, we, 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 first of all, we have to seek the opportunities in suffering. And therefore, we're going to have to know what to look for. And that's why I'm recommending Chapter 7. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I talk about suffering in terms of the increase in humility, the shocking us out of superficiality, the rescuing us from destructive paths. I'm talking about, you know, the increase in trust in God that comes, the deepening of our faith that comes comes with vulnerability. But here's the deal. You have to buy a lottery ticket. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, that old joke, you know, when, when you say, God, you know, I mean, I've been praying to win the lottery mm -hmm. and, and, and you, you, you never, you know, answered right. my prayers. And he comes down and says, you, you got to buy a ticket. Ticket first. You got to right. buy a lottery ticket. Well, the got to be thing in is, it to win it, we, they used to say in New York. Yeah. And, and so the, the point, of course, is 
we have to not only know what to look for, we have to be looking for those opportunities, seeking those opportunities, trying to capitalize on those opportunities. And as chapter 9 makes clear, following the Holy Spirit when the opportunities arise, and they do, but we can't just sit back and say the opportunities should happen to us mm -hmm. and and one of the difficulties I mean obviously uh, you know um, you're not to blame for not knowing these uh, we just haven't done a very good job sometimes in catechizing the opportunities of suffering is one of the reasons we're running all these programs on suffering and why uh, I wrote you know this book on suffering mm. oh, we really do have to get out that list of the 10 opportunities of suffering again and start not only kind of committing them uh, to heart but also looking for them when the real challenges like cancer when the real challenges are coming into our lives. Mm -hmm. We really have to reinforce our view of the resurrection and, and not to live for this world alone. We're living for the resurrection. We're living for eternal joy. Every single one of us can benefit from suffering in terms of the deepening of our faith, can benefit from suffering in terms of the deepening of humility and the deepening of love and compassion. I mean, I've recommended a lot of books, uh, you know, that, like this wonderful book of Severe Mercy by Sheldon Van Ock and The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis. There are very good books on these things, uh, on the opportunities of suffering, but we got to do right. something about it. The second thing is, uh, we have to look at the example of the saints in offering up our sufferings. Now again, you know, the problem is, are we necessarily going to notice the good that our suffering did the moment that we offer it up? Are we suddenly going to get a vision of the, 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 the self-sacrificial love that we're bringing into the world that's going to help some souls that we've been praying for or some souls that, you know, are in purgatory or some souls we don't even know about, the, the people who have no one to pray for them? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, uh, no, we're, we're not going to uh, necessarily notice it. Now, sometimes you might, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but m most of the time you don't. You have to wait until you get to heaven. You're going to have to trust in God that there there's so much fruit that can come from that suffering. We're going to have to have the faith of St. Paul of the Cross and St. Therese of Lisieux, that ability to just keep offering, keep offering, keep falling more deeply mm -hmm. in love with Christ as we're offering, and then wait patiently to have the full revelation of the good of our self-sacrifice be announced to us as we move right into the heavenly kingdom. But I, I know the frustration you must be feeling, and I'm not trying to minimize that at all. It's a real challenge. Right. And I wrote this uh, chapter five just to try and deal with the challenges, mm -hmm. the anxieties. And in a later episode, we're going to be talking about you know, how do we meet fear? How do we meet anxiety? How do we meet the frustration that you're feeling? So we are going to be talking about this uh, later in the program very, very explicitly. Right. So hang in there, but there, there are some really good things. And again, we haven't catechized. You know, St. Ignatius has had the rules for the discernment of spirits out there, you know, since the 1500s. Mm -hmm. And what people still don't know about how to follow the Holy Spirit in times of suffering just leaves you scratching your head. You, you, you know, why don't we know? I don't know why we don't know. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of things we don't know. But we, uh, you know, I would just say if we're going to offer classes in adult education in our parishes, right. one of the first classes I would offer would be how to suffer well. Right. And one of the chapters would be how to follow the Holy Spirit. So right. I, I just think it should be a universal catechesis. Right. And um, we've got our, our right. tradition is so rich. I mean, we just got to get the word out right. there. And uh, don't get frustrated, though. Keep looking for the opportunities. Keep offering it up. Keep learning more and more proficiently how to follow the Holy Spirit. Keep managing your fear and, and your daughter's right. fear now. It, it, you'll be okay. Right. You're, you're going to be okay. Right. And, and, and big, if you do it well, right. you're, you're going to experience the resurrection along right. with your daughter. Big, big part of that, obviously, is, is prayer. And, and involvement with that, and of course, you know the old line about yeah. the I, I do not 
uh, not know the things that I don't know. So I'm not, you know, if I'm not aware exactly. that I don't know them. And that's why something like this program yeah. and other programs on EWTN or, or even programs in parishes is so important for people to be able to realize that there is, uh, like you said, this great deposit of, of wisdom that is there in the church. Here's another question yeah. along those lines, but maybe a little different in another way, which is I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and I have had yep. issues like depression, anxiety, self-harm, eating disorders, drug abuse, etc. I'm doing behavior therapy right now, probably maybe some cognitive therapy, I guess. I'm 57, mm -hmm. so it's been hard, but it's done wonders for my relationship with Jesus. All I want is heaven. Yeah. What a spiritual journey. Please comment. And now this yeah. is Kimberly. Now this is somebody who seems to have actually found yeah. their spirituality Mm -hmm. you know, strengthened because of their suffering. How so? Oh, yeah, Kimberly, um, what you found is very authentic indeed. And, and um, uh, you know, go back a, a few episodes. I don't know if you remember this. We were talking about mysticism. And, and what is it that, that, that the mystic wants uh, you know, to of course purify his, you know, his or her love, um, you know, so that you know God will enter in, uh, you know, more authentically, and and they will recognize God without any of the obstructions of ego. And the one word that every single mystic uses about why they they literally go into the dark night, voluntarily going into the dark night of the soul and the dark night of the senses. Why, uh, why do they do this? They want detachment. This is what, right, first principle and foundation, right at the beginning of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. What is it we're looking for? Detachment. Detachment from the things of this world, detachment from, you know, uh, you know, the, even the, the pleasures of the senses, detachment from all of the, you know, the, 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 you know, obscurities of ego, detachment from everything that would get in the way of the purity of love or m seem more important than being with the Lord. Well, Kimberly, I can tell you for a fact. You are in the, you're riding a real race car, you know, with bipolar, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, challenges. Right. You're riding the race car of detachment. You're getting a bucket full, and that's great. I mean, I would call bipolar so similar in, in, in many ways in terms of its effects. Right, just like um, you know, the dark night of of the uh, of the senses, uh, you know what they call the the active dark night of the senses and the active dark night hmm. of the uh, of the uh, of the spirit. Um, you know, there's those dark nights. I know you're going through them, and I know you go through them periodically, and I know that you have your moments when you come out of them, but you're coming out of them in a purified way. You're coming out of them with less ego than you had before, with less dependent, dependence on sensory pleasures than you had before, with much more of an interest in God for his own self, or, you know, and, and Jesus for his self, mm -hmm. that literally at the end of the day, you are, you are uh, moving into a, a purity of love. Believe me, mm -hmm. you know, when you move through this bipolar challenge, when you get to the end of it, toward your own resurrection, you're not just going to have glimmers of the love that will be yours in the resurrection. The whole world of love is going to open upon you. Mm -hmm. And when it does, it will be a pure ecstasy. And how much purgatory will you have to go through? Mm -hmm. A lot less than me, mm -hmm. if any at all. You've been doing your homework already. And, uh, you know, I know, you know, I've I got a little purification ahead of me. And I can tell you one thing right now. You are making up for it in full with the, the, mm -hmm. with the challenges you have, the attitude you have, the opportunities for detachment that you already see in your right. faith and very specifically to the way you're probably offering it up 
to the Lord and following the Holy Spirit. Just stick with it. And, and uh, if my book helps, uh, I'm, you know, again, just, as I say, Xerox off chapters 7 and 8 and 9 and have a field day with it because okay. you're there and you're going probably straight to heaven. There we are. We're still in chapter three, and Father keeps projecting ahead here. We haven't even gotten that <laughs> far yet. So let me, here's another question that I think yeah. fits right into what we just heard about uh, and, and what you just said. And here's, here's the statement, Father, from Facebook. Does suffering in well, that is, increase our future happiness in eternity? It seems that the saints all had a huge amount of suffering and were rewarded by a closer union with God, okay? on earth and then I guess ultimately yeah. and in heaven, uh, I would add on for Rita and that's Rita's question. So, I mean, we do have people yeah. we see who have greater suffering. Uh, are there levels in heaven that because one has suffered more, how does that work or do we know? No, there, no, there are not levels in heaven where somebody gets, uh, as it were, better heaven than somebody else. I mean, heaven is the beatific vision. It is the pure. Uh, ecstasy of being with God and being with everybody else. The idea of, you know, comparative levels is simply gone. They're not needed. Uh, of course, every saint doesn't want to be on a higher level anyway because they're humble. They want to be right, right. with everybody else in the heavenly kingdom. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't get that. But just as I was mentioning in the previous question, uh, you know, are you going to need any purification? I mean, these saints, I mean, I, I honestly believe the reason they're canonized right away, the, the, the obvious ones, is because the church has already can see, not just through the miracles that, you know, they're, that are being enacted through their mm -hmm. intercession, but the church can see in the, 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 the purity of their lives and the, and the goodness of their lives and, and the detachment of their lives and, and the obedience in their lives, they can see that, that, that they're already in heaven. And so, you know, as it were, purgatory is, is non-essential. Uh, I wish I were in that category, but, uh, you know, again, I, I know I've got the ego going, mm -hmm. and I, I know I, I, I can't help myself, but, you know, I, I, I do like a good glass of wine and things of that nature, and, uh, you know, I, not a whole lot of it, but uh, and I, <laughs> I also like meat, and uh, I can't help myself, you know. Oh. I, I'm just not there with the Carmelites yet, though I love them dearly. So the, the point I'm trying to get to is, mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, we all uh, uh, have a little bit of purification ahead of us. But the person who I think is what you, you call a saint, uh, they're not going to get to a higher place in heaven, but they're going to get to heaven right. and to the ecstasy right away because they'll be with the Lord and you can't get any happier than being with him because that is the total ecstasy right. and joy of unconditional love writ large and shared with all the blessed at the big messianic banquet in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, well we're talking about the saints and we're talking about uh, suffering and we're talking about love and we're, so let's, let's also talk about this. This person wrote to us an email, please explain the extreme practices of some of the saints in light of modern psychology. Flagellation, hair shirts, prolonged fasting, pole sitting, even hermit, life seen by present day standards aberrant behaviors. How are we to understand these things as proper sufferings? And thank you, and this is from Tish. Uh, Tish, that's a very good question. And of course, the, the idea for the saints, this was all part of the active dark night of the senses and the active dark night of the spirit. So they took on uh, what we would call, vol uh, you know, voluntarily, right, radical acts of penance. Now, you, you know, when somebody does that voluntarily, right, and, and some people do, I mean, you know, you've got these Carthusians, and I'm telling you, uh, you know, if, uh, I don't know if I could sleep on, I, I know I couldn't, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't have that kind of asceticism mm -hmm. yet, but they take it on voluntarily 
because of course that you know it helps them to detach and it helps them to detach mm -hmm. from um, uh, you know the, the senses and from ego now just three things you have to bear in mind number one it has to be voluntary you can't have somebody inflicting this you know somebody requiring that kind of purgation or sacrifice that's for God to do with another human being it's not for a religious superior to do or something like that so if you see somebody coming along and saying mm -hmm. to somebody you got to wear uh, a hair shirt or you got to start putting the rocks in your shoes mm -hmm. or you got to start whipping yourself that's probably not a good idea. No, I'm just kidding. It's not a good idea. Okay, good. This should not be mandated. Yeah. This should not be required for somebody uh, at all. Number two, so it, at first, voluntary. Number two, when these things are done, it is essential that when a penance is, is done, that it cannot cause a severe harm to the body or the psyche. Oh, okay. Let me split that in two. Mm -hmm. First, we're going to talk about the body, right? So you can't be doing something that's going to cause harm to your body. The body is a sacred vessel, right? Masochism is not part of Christianity. You can't be going around stabbing yourself mm -hmm. or doing something or whipping yourself to the point of bleeding or weakening yourself or weakening your immune system. You know the drill. You can't do that. Number two, you cannot do something that actively discourages your psyche. So a penance cannot do something that will bring you to an emotional low, that will bring you into a state of depression. Are you kidding me? The whole idea, right, is to get detached, mm -hmm. not to get de depressed, right? We want to have sufficient psychic energy to love the Lord and to love the people around us so that we can show charity, right? We're not trying to inflict ourselves with depression, despair, the absence of hope. Who wants that? It is the devil, not God. So you can't push a penance so that it's going to do a psychological harm or a bodily harm that is unnecessary, right? Now, surgery is necessary, mm -hmm. et cetera. You get the point in order to, to, to cure an illness, et cetera. Let's get to the third thing. This gets back to St. Ignatius of Loyola's discernment of spirits, which is very, very important. And that is that, right, when, you know, St. Ignatius says, look, the objective of every penance Right? The objective of every pen is to increase in what really matters. What really matters? The three theological virtues. Faith, that is to say, trust in God. Hope, that is to say, mm -hmm. hope in our salvation. And love, and that is to say, like love defined by 1 Corinthians 13, right? Love is patient, love is kind, merciful, doesn't grow angry, mm -hmm. doesn't boast, doesn't rejoice in what's bad, etc. Okay, now, you just take those three things. They are more important than penances. Every saint knows where he or she is going. Mm -hmm. They're going toward faith, hope, and love because they want to get closer to God. You can't, therefore, be doing a penance which is going to kill your mm -hmm. spiritual life. Mm -hmm. You can't be doing a penance which is going to lead to decrease in trust in God mm -hmm. or is going to change your view of God from a benevolent and loving God mm -hmm. to an ogre God. You can't do that like we were talking about two weeks ago. Right. Second thing, you can't be doing penances that are going to give you a decrease in hope that will lead to despair. There's only one spirit that wants you in despair. That's not the Holy Spirit. 
That's the devil. Right. Third, you don't want to be doing penances that get you so irritable mm -hmm. and sap up all your psychic energy and stress you out so much or deprive you of so much sleep that you're going out there and turning everybody into a punching bag. Mm -hmm. You're irritated at them, you're angry right. at them, you have no psychic energy to deal with anything patiently. So if the penance is causing impatience, right. unkindness, irritability, anger, right. uh, you know, rejoicing in what is bad. Stop for crying out loud. And we've got to take a break so, right now, Father, just okay. before we do that. And it's amazing. <laughs> I, I have all of those feelings and I'm not doing any penance at all. So maybe you can explain to me later how we can <laughs> work that out. We're here with Father Spitzer. <laughs> Father Spitzer's universe talking about the chapters from his book, The Light Shines On in the Darkness, Transforming Suffering Through Faith, answering your questions. More ahead. Stay with us. Thank you so much for staying with us right here in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe where we're talking about chapters from his new book. And we rejoined Father Spitzer out in California at our beautiful studios. The light shines on in the darkness is the topic. Transforming Suffering Through the Faith is the name of the book. And we, are, we will get through chapter three here by the end of this program, I promise you that. Huh. But we have so many wonderful <laughs> questions from our viewers. Uh, that we wanted to get to some more before we uh, kind of close things out uh, on this particular chapter. So let's look at that next question. When suffering sure. is severe and lasts for years, how does one go about not being angry at God for allowing these things to happen? Is being angry with God ever justified? And this is Valerie, probably two good questions. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, uh, Valerie, um, uh, whether anger is justified with God uh, is, is justified. You know, that, that gets down into whether one has a voluntary disposition uh, toward anger. And most of the time, frankly, we don't. Mm -hmm. when, when we are angry with God during times in our suffering, we're not voluntarily being angry. We're, we're expressing spontaneous frustration or frustration that's pent up within us over a long period of time. And, and that frustration, uh, you know, we, we can just dart out. And, you know, I mean, I've done it. You know, as you mm -hmm. know, I wrestle uh, with progressive blindness. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and every time, you know, I, I noticed a change or something like that, I'd always have these little, you know, mini outbursts, you know, or, you know, sometimes, you know, I'd, I'd have that St. Uh, Teresa of Avila, yeah. you know, of this is how you treat your right. friends. You know, wonder you have so few, mm. you know, and, and uh, you know, right. so you, you can have those outbursts right. uh, that happen very spontaneously. I mean, I remember once, you know, I, I used to be able to kind of handle about, you know, I had about 20 airports mastered and, and my eyes got so bad that, you know, I started bumping into poles and, oh. you know, doing really stupid stuff. I felt embarrassed and, you know, I, I would almost be, you know, I mean, uh, you know, both angry at myself, embarrassed and, you know, angry at God. But, you know, essentially, God understands completely. Mm -hmm. He knows what's going on in our lives. He knows that we're feeling loss. He knows that, you know, this is, there's a, a, a you know, a, you know, it, it takes a lot to stay on top of this thing, to keep following the Holy Spirit, to keep our faith moving and, and, and so forth. Even Mother Teresa, right, could, could you know, you know, had those, that sense of just being, you know, alone and just, you know, yeah. almost like the psalmist, how long? You know, you could say, well, is that kind of frustration? Is that, yes, I, I, I think it, it fairly can be called frustration. But the main thing to remember is, number one, God understands that frustration and anger. Number two, for yourself and for your faith, you're going to have to choose mm -hmm. to move beyond it. 
There is a point at which you can just dwell in anger. This is not going to be good for you. This is not going to be good for your relationship with God. This is going to literally undermine all the good you can get out of suffering. Don't go there. I mean, there's a certain appropriate kind of time, and eventually you're going to have to make a choice. I did in my own life with the eyesight. You know, I had to choose to do some things that I knew would obviate my frustration. Mm -hmm. Number one, I knew that if I keep comparing myself to the way I once was, all that's going to do is going to make me angry and frustrated. Mm -hmm. So I just said one day, I choose not to make comparisons to the way I once was. Now, sometimes it comes up, and I can't control it completely, uh -huh. but I have a lot of control over it now, and I can choose not to do that. I can just choose to, as it, they say, just let it go. Number two, I just recognized that when I compared myself to normal people, right, who could just do this or get in a car and drive or, you know, not have a reader mm -hmm. and so forth and so on, every time I did that, I get frustrated mm -hmm. and angry. Why can't I do this? You know, it'd be, life would be so much easier. Mm -hmm. I just said, I'm not doing that anymore. I choose not to compare myself to others. Number three, I recognized that every time I had one of those expectations, oh, any day now, I'll get a miracle. Any day now, you know, uh, I should get X, Y, and Z from the suffering I'm going through. I should see purification in my love. I should see all the people who are benefiting from the suffering I'm offering up for them. I should see what I call the false expectation mm. syndrome. Because, of course, when you suffer from dashed expectations, you're going to get frustrated and angry. And I just decided I'm not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. I choose not to do those things that are going to make me frustrated mm -hmm. and angry. And I'm going to give up the old Job complex, you know, where Elihu chastises him, you know, I'm a righteous man. I don't deserve this. Mm -hmm. That's not the question I finally learned after a long time. It's not about whether I deserve it or whether I don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. Suffering is occurring in my life, whether it's by natural laws or something else. Mm -hmm. What I have to do is accept it in trust of God and look for all the opportunities I can get from it to advance my salvation, others' salvation, to deepen my love, mm -hmm. to deepen my faith, to help others deepen their love and deepen their faith, and above all, to offer it up as a self-offering. I accept the cross. Mm -hmm. I accept the suffering. Stop the question, Spitzer. I mean, I'm talking to myself here, right? right? I'm right, not talking right, to you. Right, no. I'm talking to myself, I'm saying, you know, stop that, I don't deserve it. And when I stop saying that, for all intents and purposes, man, did my anger level go down. But you got to make those choices about expectations. You got to make the choice to get out of the Job complex. I'm a righteous man. I don't deserve it. Right. You got to make the choice not to compare yourself to other people. And you got to make the choice right. not to compare yourself to the way life once was. Life was right. You know, and if you can stay away from those things, I'm telling you, right. your anger level is going to be much, much better. Just replace it with beautiful trust in God and offering it up right. and looking for the opportunities that will come through the right. suffering. Well, I know Father Benedict Rochelle, like great Father Benedict Rochelle, great friend of the network, a uh, great Franciscan used to say in those situations, yeah. the, question, the question yeah. isn't why, the question is what. It's not why I'm suffering, but what am I supposed to do yeah. with this situation, right? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. So. Okay, let's I couldn't add to that wisdom, right, right. period. So. <laughs> and uh, we would, we, I'll go out on a limb and say we can pray to him too, as far as on, on a personal level, because I certainly think oh, yeah. Father Benedict, oh, if he's, yeah, he's not a uh, official saint, he, he certainly 
is a saint. Uh, He's up and coming. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so we also have another question here, uh, this one having to do with suffering as well. But again, some interesting takes here. Suffering makes me think of God, how he loves mankind to send his only begotten son to be among us who himself suffered because of my sins. Somehow I could feel that my suffering is nothing compared to his. And this is Nessie. And it's interesting, I hope I pronounced that correctly, it reminded me of Mother Angelica who in many ways relied on her suffering to keep her spiritual life together. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I have to uh, you say two things. Number one, Nessie, I, I think you're absolutely correct. I, I do think that sometimes when we just look upon the suffering of the Lord in gratitude, Gratitude is so terrific for building up love. I mean, you know, I look at my suffering, I don't necessarily discount it because, you know, there are days, you know, um, you know, where it, it can get, you know, pretty challenging. But the main thing, though, that I try to do is to say to the Lord, I know what you did to come be with me in my suffering. I know what you did, not only to come be with me in my suffering, but to come and rescue me, uh, you know, and, and then save me through my suffering. And in that moment of gratitude, it really does make our love deepen, and that helps us to manage, you know, the, the, the kind of frustrations and angers and fears that we have in our times of suffering. So, Nessie, I, I, I just think you're... You're right on the marker. I think looking at the Lord in, in gratitude is going to lead to deeper love, and that's going to help you to, to manage suffering. And, and furthermore, of course, you can see, you know, when you see what the Lord went through, you can see the power of self-offering in suffering, which, of course, motivates me all the more to offer my sufferings for the world for the, the souls in purgatory, and for the people that I know and love. So um, uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, you're right on the marker, Nessie. Right. Now you write in, in your book, uh, I am uh, always with you always, you say it is sometimes quite difficult yeah. to interrupt our initial feelings of abandonment, isolation, dismay, or even frustration and anger to allow rationality its proper place in our encounter with suffering. Our initial feelings yeah. can be so powerful that they take over our consciousness. Nevertheless, for our sake, the truth's sake, yeah. the whole story, we must cultivate a discipline of allowing rationality and knowledge into our otherwise occupied conscious space. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that ration, like what I was just talking about before, about how to uh, deal with, uh, you know, feelings of frustration and anger. There's another set of feelings that you have to deal with, and that's fear and anxiety. Because mm -hmm. when certain kinds of suffering come, there's always going to be fear and anxiety, too. Like when, my, when I first experienced my eye disease, it wasn't so much frustration and anger, though that did happen. Mm -hmm. There was fear and anxiety, like, how will I ever complete my doctoral dissertation? How will I ever, you know, bring my scholarly career to a fruition? How will I ever get a book published? How, will, you know, and all of a sudden, right, all these things, you know, mm -hmm. well, maybe, uh, you know, uh, and should I even stay in the society of Jesus? I actually had the nerve to tell my superior, you know, if you want to boot me out, you know, I'm damaged goods. I, I completely <laughs> understand, you know, but all this is coming out of fear and anxiety. Right. And, and, you know, so I, so now, how do you manage fear and anxiety? And again, I'm getting ahead to chapter five, but what I do want to say is rationality is a huge part of it. That simple, you know, sometimes when you, you try to manage fear, you go, okay, I'm going to stop being fearful. And you know what happens, right? You get more fearful right, trying right, to stop right, yourself right, right. from being fearful. Right. So the, the main thing is, I always just say, stop right away and start thinking about four rational questions because reason will take your lower brain, will take that fear factor out of the picture. Use your higher brain, use the cerebral cortex, use the rational questions to literally mitigate the fear. Number one question, 
what are the backup plans I can think about? So, okay, I've got an eye problem here. Let me think this through. How can I manage to get my doctoral dissertation finished? Start thinking about backup plan A and backup plan B. How will I get readers? How will I be, you know, let me research some stuff, you know, uh, on, on, you know, handicap accessible, uh, you know, uh, you know, things in, in, in a collegiate setting. H how can I use a new technology like an iPad that could read to me, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So ask, just be utterly rational. Mm -hmm. How can I, you know, get some backup plan. Number two, who can I ask for help, right? So that the idea is don't go it alone. The first thing you want to do is think about who can help me. Or, or, or if it's sometimes if it's, you know, like somebody in my religious order, or is there some kind of a service that I can get from the church or, or from, you know, some other agency, a charitable agency or something of that nature. Who can help me? Who among my friends can give me some ideas about how I can manage this, this problem and, and things of that nature? So again, the mind is going and it's thinking through these things and it's making a list of, 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 you know, people that might be helpful. And the one thing you want to do as you're thinking through these questions mm -hmm. is don't hesitate and stop and think, Joe and Harry and Mary can help me. And then you don't pick up the phone and call. You get stuck in that ab abeyance. You know, you got to make the, the, the step. You got to not only have the thought, but you have to have the rational desire. You're going to have to take that f first step and pick up the phone and call Harry and Joe and Mary. You've got to, with respect to the first question, when you're making your backup plans, you got to be thinking to yourself, you know, how in the world, you know, am I going to, you know, what's the first step I can take, you know, to making, you know, to getting some help from an agency or to applying to college, you know, how am I going to, how am I going to take my GRE? I can't take it the same way I used to take it, you know, just kind of zooming on through. I'm going to have to figure out a way, et cetera. So the th our third good rational question, uh, you know, to be asking yourself is, you know, right while you're thinking about about this is this telling me something is this uh, suffering is it getting me off a path mm -hmm. that uh, was destroying me you know in other words you're asking a question for discernment is this suffering going to help me right away immediately to stop something I'm doing or, or some is, is there some a real immediate blessing in this suffering or am I just being a superficial idiot uh, you know and, and is this a call for me to kind of get out of you know some kind of superficiality uh, some kind of uh, heartlessness etc cetera, etc cetera. so again just asking yourself these rational questions that allow for reflection to take place practical questions about the what and the who and what lessons and opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. As long as you're asking these rational questions, watch what happens to your fear level. Even in combat, when you are in, in a combat situation, notice that if you just get downright rational, mm -hmm. okay, what am I going to do to, to you know, get out of this situation? And you start becoming rational you start becoming very cool-headed. Mm -hmm. Even in a situation in business where everything is collapsing and around you, don't give in to the fear. Mm -hmm. Literally start thinking and then bringing other people in on the thinking and then get group thinking. And I'm telling you, these are the things that will mitigate the fear and will of course give you the rational knowledge that you need to move beyond it. Prayer works through it all. And the spontaneous prayers that we're going to discuss mm -hmm. next week, you'll see some really right. good benefits that come from it. But for the time being, right. you do have to manage the anger, frustration, right. fears, uh, I mean, uh, uh, feelings, mm -hmm. and you do have to m manage the fear and anxiety right. feelings. But if you can m manage both poles of those right. feelings through the methods we've been talking about in this program, 
you, you know, you can, you're going to be in real good shape. Right. Uh, you're going to get a lot out of your suffering, right. and you're going to be able to identify opportunities, right. life changes, real humility, blessings, loves. You're going to have whole new paths right. of serving the Lord, ministry in the church. Right. There's going to be a ton of blessings uh, in, in, in your suffering, yeah. but you do have to manage the feelings. Right. It's, uh, I remember years ago there used to be the let go, let God approach kind of that idea of sometimes yeah. we're trying to control things or we believe in the high tech world we live in today that we can control these kinds of things like talking about, well, I'm living this really good life and everything's fine. Uh, and so many times I think yeah. when people see bad things happen to people, they think, well, they must have, like the, uh, mm -hmm. the early Jews would have thought in the Old Testament, yeah. well, what did that person do wrong? In a lot of ways, I think we do it to separate ourselves yeah. from that situation thinking, well, I, I'm not doing that, so that's not gonna happen to me. If it's just random, it yeah. makes it yeah. scarier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You just uh, like it, absolutely. And uh, you get right back to that question. Why again? Mm -hmm. Don't ask it. Right. Ask the question. What? Right. What am I? You know, accept the suffering. Uh, this is a, a potential gift from God. What am I going to do with it? Right. You know, but the harder you fight it and the more you ask for all the reasons. Mm -hmm. And I want to know now, the more you are going to torment yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no good will come out okay. of it. No, no good. And here's the challenge, Father. We've got about five minutes, Max, and we've got a huh. question about something called the five habits of the heart. So I'm going to set the timer here. Oh, yeah. Tell us what that is. Okay. Well, um, we've already been talking about some of the habits of the heart, but number one habit of the heart, keep yourself humble enough to accept suffering. That is absolutely crucial. So we don't want to go into the Job syndrome. I'm a righteous man. I don't deserve it. You know, we don't know what can, good can come. We got to keep humble so that we can absolutely trust in God. The second attitude of the heart, right, that, that's conjoined to that is, is to make an actual choice to trust in God. Number three, make an actual choice to stay rational in the ways that we talked about previously, and then also to, you know, to manage the anger by accepting the suffering and trying to look for the opportunities in it. Number four, keep God's purpose in mind. What is God looking for? How's he going to lever our suffering toward the greatest opportunities? We're going to have to remember what we said at the beginning of the program. We have to look for the opportunities. We've got to do something about it. So we're going to have to actually know what to look for. Look for the change in life. Look for the shocking out of superficiality. Look for the possible uh, deepening of humility. Look for the vulnerability that is going to cause you to need God more, turn to God more, deepen your faith, and deepen your trust. Look for the, the deepening of compassion. Look for the deepening of empathy with another human being. Look for the detachment that we were talking about earlier on, the detachment from the things of this world and the detachment from ego that is so essential to, to the purification of our love. Look for the ways in which we can advance the salvation of others. Look for the way we can advance the salvation of ourselves. If we can do this and, and pay attention, right, we know what we're looking for, then all we got to do is know how to follow the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about following the Holy Spirit later, but there, the Holy Spirit is present to you immediately. Mm -hmm. So that the, the idea is, you know, um, when, when suffering comes, mm -hmm. But the main thing to do is, first of all, to know that the Holy Spirit is there and that the Holy Spirit is opening up a door every time a door slams in your life. Another door is being opened up and the Holy Spirit's opening it and he's introducing you to a new path or maybe to a new ministry of service to the Lord or maybe to a new level of humility or maybe, we don't know, but the door is opening up and sooner or later, because the Holy Spirit, just keep opening the door, keep opening the door all the time. The Holy Spirit, when that door is open, he's just going to keep, 
you know, uh, urging you. He's not going to push you through the door, though. Right. He's going to try and draw you through the door. He's going to try and make it attractive and fascinating and desirable, intriguing, enchanting. Right. He's going to try and draw you through. But you're going to have to use an act of freedom. You're going to have to go through that door. Okay. And as you go through that door, right, into, sure you, you know, the, uh, the, the light you, of the Holy Spirit, right, you, you got to discern, right. and we'll talk and about that discernment right. um, Next time. And then when we get to exactly. chapter 9. Exactly, because uh, not only is the door closing, and you better get through it, the window's <laughs> closing on our time for this program. So we will see you again once more, Father Spitzer. Have a wonderful week, and God bless. Stay healthy. Uh, take care of that cold, okay? And join us next oh, time do. when we see Father Spitzer. Of course, we'll talk about the next chapter, chapter uh, four, I think, in the light shines on in the darkness. And don't forget that EWTN.com has all the information about when this show re-airs and all the other fine programs happening on EWTN. And again, uh, next time, it's take this cup away from me. Okay, spontaneous prayers in times of suffering. Remember, we've talked about that before, but here's a, a review of that. And of course, a lot of people got a lot out of that whole idea of using spontaneous prayers. We'll try and be spontaneous next time. I'm Doug Keck. We shall see you at the intersection of faith and reason once again. Thanks. <laughs>